Hey there, Culture Gab Fest listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our sponsors, Charles Schwab. At Schwab, a passion for serving clients is not just part of a job description. It's one of their core values. It's this human element that helps set Schwab apart. Stick around to hear how Ray, a Schwab employee who designs digital experiences, works to provide more people with access to the financial tools and knowledge they deserve. This episode is brought to you by Saks.com. You know, at holiday time, everybody has somebody on their list that it's hard to shop for. I think for me, the hardest person would probably be my dad. Is it possible that dads in general are tough relatives to shop for? I know in my family, uh, everyone I can think of who is a male parent is a difficult gift choice person. If you have people like that on your holiday list, a quick scroll of the Saks.com holiday gift guide is the easy way to shop for everyone on your list. They have everything from whiskey glasses to handheld weights to beauty sets. For the hardest to please, the editors at Saks.com have picked out Baccarat Barware and Versace Home Decor. Saks digital stylists are even available to give you free gifting help and personalized recommendations, whether you're shopping for others or for yourself. Plus free shipping, free returns every day at Saks.com. I'm Stephen Metcalf, and this is the Slate Culture Gap Fest. Explain crypto to me like I'm a golden retriever edition. It's Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. On today's show, Weird, the Al Yankovic story is a pitch-perfect biopic parody starring Daniel Radcliffe as Weird Al. And then we discuss, at last, I'm so excited, Dairy Girls, the wonderfully peculiar and endearing sitcom about a group of teens growing up in Northern Ireland during the tail end of the Troubles. Uh, It's just wrapped up its uh, three-year run. And finally, when it comes to crypto, who isn't a bit of a golden retriever, right? A happy, sort of thoughtless cutie pie with the tongue lolling out of your mouth stupidly. Well, the financial writer, non-pare, how do you say, is that how you say that, Dana? Francophone? (laughs) that'll do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> ça roll. va, ça va, monsieur. Ça va bien. All right, non pare. Matt Levine, uh, he's not a golden retriever when it comes to crypto or anything finance related. He's written the explainer to end all crypto explainers. Uh, we will discuss crypto with Matt himself. In the meantime, joining me today is Julia Turner, the deputy managing editor at the LA Times. Hey, Julia. Hello, hello. And uh, Dana Stevens, the uh, film critic for Slate. Hey, Dana. Hey, hey. Uh, are we ready to make a show? Let's do it. Okay. The Weird Al Yankovic story is, weirdly enough, it's on Roku. It's been aptly described as a note-for-note parody of the biopic genre. It starts accordingly with the artist in his spiral phase, glutted on fame and abusable substances. Freeze frame, how did we get here? And we go back to the origin story and off we go. It stars Daniel Radcliffe, who kind of swole since his Harry Potter days. A little bit of a surprise for me. And uh, Evan Rachel Wood as Madonna. There's Al himself is in it. Very funny turn as a jerky record exec. All right. In the clip we're about to hear, Al is a layabout. He's making bologna sandwiches for his three layabout roommates when the song My Sharona comes on the radio and suddenly he's inspired. Let's listen. Who am I living? Where did that come from? Dude, I've got chills. I don't know, it just came out of me. I've never heard anything like that before in my life. You have to record that. Record it? No, come on, guys. Oh, you've got something here. I don't know if it comes from God or the devil. The (laughs) world needs to hear it. No, forget it, guys. I don't have the money for a recording studio. I think the bathroom at the bus station is pretty good acoustics. I mean, I don't know if our producer is going to bring the volume up on our, you know, spontaneous real-time reactions to that clip, Dana, but it says it all. I think I, I feel like I know how you felt about this movie <laughs> Just already. Just something about the pause between the two <laughs> moments of invention of the, the lyrics to My Bologna. Yeah, I mean, what can you say about this movie? I feel like I don't have a ton to say that the movie doesn't already do for you. I, mm. for one, did not at all feel like I needed another 
parody music biopic from anyone. As I say in my review of this movie on Slate, I felt like Walk Hard kind of did the job so well that it never needed to be redone. And I even felt that way about Pop Star, the, um, you yeah. know, Andy Samberg starring um, music biopic parody, which was fun, you know, but which felt a little bit like a thin extended joke. And yet somehow this movie yeah. totally captured my heart. And I think a huge part of it to me goes to, well, OK, Yankovic himself co-wrote the movie, yes. right? So it's his spirit infusing it. And Daniel Radcliffe just brings it to this role, <laughs> like the amount of of sincere commitment that he brings to this utterly absurd fake biopic stuffed with obvious lies, and yet that still manages to have a few truly emotional moments was was kind of a wonder to witness. And uh, I just love that it didn't take itself too seriously, and uh, and that it really enjoyed the music and gave us a lot of music. But Julia, you said you have a lot to say about this movie, unlike me. So other than just snorting at that wonderful <laughs> scene with the doofus roommates, who, by the way, are some of my favorite characters, very, very the basically good. nameless, like, three dudes <laughs> right. that he lives with. Yeah, he just happens to... Like, and they're just like, they just happen to play musical instruments. Like, they never mention yeah, it. Yeah, he needs a backing band, and it just so happens he lives with a bassist, a guitarist, and a drummer. But Julia, I want to hear what what flow of um, you know of, of of insight you have about the the Weird Al story. I don't actually have very much to say other than I liked it so much over and over and over again. So <laughs> I guess you know I went in with fairly low expectations. It didn't get. The best reviews, everyone's like, oh, it's kind of a trifle. It's on the Roku channel. What even is that? My husband and I were like running around the house, like trying to do all this like screen mirroring and like searching for the Roku app. And then I Googled it and you can just stream it on the Roku website for free. I was like, oh, this this is a solvable technical problem. <laughs> um I would argue that this is worth watching in the walk hard pop star never stop never stopping uh lineage because the specificity of the comedy is so weird al and that's slightly different like mm -hmm. it's not making fun of the biopic genre in order to make fun of the biopic genre it's making fun of the biopic genre in order to enact an ode to weird al sensibility which is like a different reason to make fun of the biopic genre mm -hmm. in some ways. You know, like the thing that the the film starts doing, which is having, a, a, like it's very hard to get your head around tonally for the first 20 minutes or so because you're like, wait, what's going to happen? There's like violent beatings in this movie. <laughs> there's... Um, there's like boater wearing accordion salesman. Like, <laughs> what is Te this teenage movie? polka parties? Forbidden <laughs> that, polka parties. Yes, uh, that that's may the, have been that where is, I, That's yeah. the that's the first moment he sneaks out to a party. <laughs> polka is just blaring, and like the kids are <laughs> rocking out to polka. <laughs> and they just um, like his sense of humor about his shtick and the unlikeliness of his success is just so charming and adds an additional layer um you know fundamentally it's a weird owl song right you take the story you know and you just like swap in some different words for different parts of it to see what you can make like it's his sensibility transposed onto the biopic and um it, it it's just very very enjoyable i will agree with you dana in your review it's not so great on the gender front mm -hmm. like the the evan rachel wood's madonna is pretty funny as a villain but the fact that um uh, she, she's evil which i didn't mind but she's also a terrible shot so she's incompetently evil like it, it began to feel slightly sexist and i wouldn't go so far as to accuse weird the weird al ethos of being fundamentally sexist but it's a little thoughtless about gender in a way that that wasn't my fave uh, can you talk a little bit about that part of your review? Yeah, I mean, that stretch, is it's a strange thing where it's, it would be easy to say, particularly about this kind of movie that's basically an extended comedy sketch. In fact, it literally is spinning out the director Eric Appel's own fake trailer for such a movie that he made, I don't know, a dozen years ago, right? And he's now padded it out into a full-length movie. So it's not at all unusual that those kind of movies, like an SNL movie, falls off at the end. But this movie does something slightly different. It falls off in the middle, I think, during that Madonna segment, and then springs back to life again when when that subplot is over. And why that subplot doesn't work, I think, really just has to do with the character and the arc not being well thought through. It's almost accidentally sexist. I don't think it sets, yeah. sets out to take down Madonna, certainly, or to, you know, create a, a femme fatale for the sake of, of demeaning women. It's just 
not really interested in exploring the uh, the the nuances right. or psychology of that relationship. I mean, it's sort of funny to talk about psychological nuance in a movie like this. But for example, Weird Al's relationship with his roommates <laughs> feels more like right. something we're invested in right. than this kind of straw woman of Madonna being created. Who, who, right? She's this right. seductive femme fatale, and then she kind of gets involved with a drug cartel. And basically, she is all the villainy of the movie is kind of heaped onto her, almost out of just just narratological right. laziness. It, it just kind of doesn't work. I I agree. But even though I think she's very f- funny, Evan Rachel Wood is doing what she can with it and is vamping and, and like kind of being um, great. But the I, idea that Madonna is always voguing, mm, just even during a conversation, yeah, right. <laughs> is a nice touch. It's, it's funny. So here's the thing. I just kept think. I mean, I went in thinking, I cannot believe who picked this as a topic. And then I just kept on like experiencing the pleasure of onboarding jumping on the movie's, you know, bandwagon over and over and over again. I think the first one that really got me is when his mom, like they're in a stultifying kind of ranch house childhood, you know, and the mom and the father at the dinner table and the father's this nightmare, Eisenhower, you're a patriarch. And the mother, you know, with her little permed hair, looks at him and says, dear, we agreed it would be best for all of us if you stopped being who you are and doing the thing you love. And I just thought that is the fucking funniest line. And I was there for the really the rest of it. It's I And the thing, I'd say two things about its charms. The first is that powerfully one has always felt for this ubiquitous, very silly, you know, just fact of our cultural universe now for like, God, I mean, we're coming up on 50 years, is that this guy would be doing this alone in his house to amuse his kids and his neighbors, right? Like, like Weird Al's not doing anything that Weird Al doesn't find fun and silly and just nonsensical. And it's just pure juvenile whimsy and with i don't know i just i sense the absence of cynicism in everything weird al does i hope i'm not wrong and the second thing i'd say is just personally there's some i I grew up and i think weird al grew up in a time when you know there was still clearly a mainstream in america it was still dominated by like middle-aged wasp men in, in, you know, demure suits. Um, You know, there was like an establishment and there was a mainstream still. And so being juvenile was being juvenile. It was being freaking juvenile because there was still this construct of the grown-up and the adult. And so I remember I didn't like Dr. Demento. You know, it came on the radio and I, I didn't really stick with it. But I certainly... I certainly listened to it and it was certainly it was just part of this idea that like on the fringes, the mainstream indulges this weird juvenile, slightly anti-establishment, you know, stuff. And it just it collapsed. And like the distinction between that margin and the sort of center of culture was lost. And that's when being juvenile, like comedy becomes big comedy and being juvenile becomes monetizable. I think Weird Al has just always transcended that. You know, the cinematic equivalent, it occurs to me, to that kind of culture, which then became the mainstream because they were so popular, were the Zucker, Abraham Zucker movies, like Airplane and the Naked Gun movies. And those are clearly a referent here. I mean, here's something that differentiates this from other kind of music biopic parodies, maybe, is that it it, it harks back to that style of humor, where there's a gag per minute. They don't, there doesn't have to be any logical set of principles tying the reality together, right? And uh, and there's just this joyous anarchy. Um, It makes a lot of sense that this would be in that tone, since Weird Al himself was in all three of the Naked Gun movies. But it also has that cameo, you know, that incredible proliferation of cameos from those movies. So, I mean, for just a few seconds in this movie, you'll see, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda and Jack Black and who else is in it will forte and conan, conan o'brien. o'brien yeah just and michael mckean like every possible sort of comedy staple from you know the past few decades just pops up for at least a short appearance and i mentioned this in my review but i particularly love the party scene at dr demento's house yeah. dr demento being played by rain wilson where just every single kind of comedy face of the 1980s appears yeah. you know oh, played so by good. some some contemporary comic <laughs> and jack black in particular as wolfman jack mm-hmm. just had me uh, on the floor that's a really funny scene yeah i agree I just came by to lay eyes on this cat you've been parading around. The one who takes pre-existing musical compositions and completely changes the lyrics. 
Here, here. Well, it's a weird colon the Al Yankovic story, and it's right there on like Roku. Just Google it. You can watch it for free. Nothing arcane about finding it. Do it. It's really fun. Okay, moving on. All right, now is the moment in the podcast we talk about a sponsor, Dana Stevens. We like uh, income flow here at the Gap Fest. <laughs> make it rain, baby. Make it rain, baby. What do we got? The Slate Culture Gap Fest is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? Smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary, discounts vary, and are not available in all states and situations. All right. Well, now is the moment in the podcast we discuss business. Inevitably, Dana, we have some. What uh, would you bring to us? Just a wee bit, uh, as has been the case lately, our only item of business today is to tell you about today's Slate Plus segment. So this week, we're back to listener questions. We got a good listener question from a listener named Anne, who wrote to us mainly because she wanted to recommend a podcast called Comfort Eating with Grace Dent. And that sounds like a good recommendation for November, the month of cooking and eating. So we will check that out. But Anne also had a suggestion that the three of us talk about our favorite comfort foods for a Slate Plus segment. She wanted to know what we eat in times of stress. Actually, today's we're recording is uh, election day, midterm election, so it's a good stress eating day. Um, we will address that question, our favorite comfort foods, and maybe look toward Thanksgiving and what we cook for comfort uh, in the month of November. If you're a Slate Plus member, you can look forward to hearing that conversation at the end of this show. And if you're not a Slate Plus member, you can sign up today at slate.com slash culture plus. As the members out there know, when you're a member, you get a lot of perks, including ad-free podcasts, bonus segments like the one I just described, which many other shows offer too, and a of course, unlimited access to all of the great writing on Slate. When you're a Slate Plus member, you're supporting us, our work, and the work of our brilliant colleagues. These memberships matter a lot for Slate. So please sign up today at slate.com slash culture plus. Once again, that's slate.com slash culture plus. Okay, Steve, what's next? All right. Well, Dairy Girls, it's uh, exquisitely small in one sense. Very, very funny coming of age story set against the backgrounds of a you know, huge historical conflict, the Troubles, the low-grade 30-year war that tore apart Ireland, especially Northern Ireland, where our four lovable Irish girls and one boy and English cousin live. They are lovable. They're impish fuck-ups in a very Catholic society going to a very Catholic school. And it's a society whose nerves are frayed by the constant specter of violence, but built into the show from the beginning was an endpoint. They are coming of age and leaving their Catholic high school, what we'd call high school, and the Good Friday Agreements, which more or less ended the troubles. So, and we, you know, one would notice those timelines are set to coincide at the beginning of the show. Anyway, um, the show is now over. It's it's ended its third season. It's on Netflix. Um, let's listen to a clip. Here's one from season two of the show. The girls are about to have a very rare encounter with some Protestant students. It's part of a school field trip. And we're going to hear them prepping for that encounter. These prods have some serious moves up their sleeves, you know. They're not as fucked up about sex as we are. They put the work on. They know what they're doing. <sighs> they're people, Michelle. They're not the sex toys. I beg to differ. I'm really looking forward to making friends with some lads. Lads aren't going to make friends with you, James. Lads make friends with other lads. I am a lad. So you are, James. <laughs> OK, how much money do we have? Look, the writing of the Protestants is one thing, but I don't see why we have to buy them a present. I mean, they already have all the land, all the jobs, and all the fucking rights. Hi, Michelle. That's definitely the attitude we should have entering under this weekend. Julia, if you don't love this television show, you are so dead to me, and dead is forever. Uh, Julia, what do you think of Dairy Girls? 
<laughs> no, no brash. <laughs> Um, it's really, really enjoyable. I mean, I think we've all been hearing such great things about it for years and we wanted to, to visit it and, and sink into it on the occasion of the series ending. Um, and I get why everyone's been so excited about it. It's tone and it's humor are really specific. I mean, it fits into Mm -hmm. the lineage of kind of a black comedy gallows humor, um, the, the foibles of, human life and insecurity and mundane travails um, continuing to unfold in the context of, you know, chaos, violence, enmity, and deep historical conflict. Like, that's sort of a genre or a type, but you feel absolutely transported in the world. And the thing I'm interested to hear both of you talk about as critics is how the show pulls that off, because the performances are odd. Like, they're not quite natural is it naturalistic they're a bit bent they're they're a little bit over much i mean actually i here i'll give you i'll give a, i'll take a crack at saying something that will cause you to excommunicate me steve i think the main actress the one who plays aaron oh god is like by far the worst actor on the show be careful and kind of tread, <laughs> kind of don't like her performance tread, tread, tread carefully um, but it works because they're all operating at this like slightly oscillating fever pitch. And maybe that's uh, a commentary on humanity and warfare. I don't know what it is. Why does it work? Why does it work even though the performances are so weird? I guess I don't understand what you mean by weird. I think that main actress whose name is Saoirse Monica Jackson, who plays, I guess, sort of the the uh, the alter ego of Lisa McGee, the creator, like right? It, yeah. The girl who wants to grow up to be a writer and is incredibly pompous and pretentious <laughs> about it. I mean, I think she's fantastic. Yeah, but it's very agree. much, I saw her performance in one review we read compared to Jim Carrey, you know, early Jim <laughs> Carrey. She's very rubber faced. You yeah. know, she's... um. She's not afraid to look ridiculous and sound ridiculous and kind of lampoon her own character. Teenagers have rights now, you know. Don't be ridiculous. They do, ma. It's true. Sure, Macaulay Coco might be divorced and has parents. It's not the kind of person you usually get as the the pensive writerly girl at the you know at, which is sort of a trope in you know movies about or shows about teen girls, right? That there's the the pensive writerly one, but this particular pensive writerly one is constantly mocking her own pretensions yeah. in a way I found hilarious. But it's it's true that this movie has a specific tone yes. that makes it able to work, right? I mean, how can it be that there's this 20-minute teen comedy against the background of all this civil strife and violence that doesn't feel like those two things are clashing, you no, know? not at all. Um, I mean, Lisa McGee herself has said, this is very autobiographical, she did go to an all-girls Catholic school in Derry, Ireland during the Troubles, right? So it's specifically based on things that she's experienced. And yet it's true that it seems to take place in a world that feels like a sitcom. And that mm-hmm. sounds like a put down, but it's it's in the best way, right? I mean, every family member in the packed household that Aaron, that main character lives in, is so specifically drawn. And uh, how does the show pull it off? Yeah, exactly. I know it? one yeah. thing that Lisa McGee also said in an interview is that she initially did not set this as a period piece during the trouble. She just wanted to write a show about teen girls in the present day. And that one of the producers sat down with her and said, well, you have all of this great life experience. Why don't you set it in the past and incorporate this? And her initial response was, oh, but that's going to bring it down. You know, I don't want to make some sort of serious political show. When I was growing up, this was just the world that was around me. And so that's how she wrote it. You know, so so this isn't, I think I put off watching this show because I thought, oh, it's going to be depressing and violent and the main characters are going to all be constantly getting, you know, bombed and, you know, tearing each other limb from limb or something. It really is in tone a little bit like Reservation Dogs, a show that we all loved, I think, and talked about last year, or like Freaks and Geeks, which it's been compared to. There's something playful and truly teenage about it that just that just works. Absolutely. I agree with all of that, Dana. One thing I pick out from what you just said is it, you know, it was just the world that Lisa McGee grew up in. And it was, I think, that that made it possible to have it be just the world, quote unquote, just the world in which these characters live and not an occasion for a highly self-conscious, overwrought and occasionally mawkish examination of a very ugly period in history. So it's just there. It's what they're in the midst of. And that's exactly how people live in cope, right? Like they they go on. They're ordinary in, in, in the face of extraordinary circumstances that others can't believe they even survived. And so here's, I mean, I love so much about the show. It's rapidly approaching Schitt's Creek territory for me. It's like a little wrinkle 
in a dying world's fabric that I just want to crawl into and never, ever leave, right? But I, one thing I want to uh, like talk about it a little, little bit is its tone, because, Julia, I agree with you in this way. The, the tone is very singular. It's jagged, uh, especially at first. I felt like it took some getting used to. It, it's, it's loud, staccato, jagged. The acting style is very broad. Um, but it somehow, that's kind of, to me, the point of intersection between a, they live in a community that's a war zone and they don't know when the war will break out and how around them. And I think there's a way in which that just is omnipresent, but never quite present. And it's in their affect. And the show is very wise. It never shows you, it never puts in your face how wise it is and how subtle it is. You have to discover those as you go, but when you discover them, the riches are remarkable because the show's not only is it very wise about being an adolescent and being in high school, but it's very wise about how nations are like families and families are like nations. You know, that that conflict and love are inseparable parts of a single thing in some sense. And, and I think feel strongly, Julia, as though the tonality has something to do with that, that that kind of expressions of affection. I mean, that's very sitcom, right? But here it doesn't feel like a standard sitcom thing where expressions of affection and familiarity often take the form of a kind of put down, right? Or there's a, where it's something like that. But there's, for here, it feels earned and, and quite real. And, and the ensemble, I mean, the ensemble is just, to my mind, is just amazing, can I just shout out somebody who is not a teenager and who absolutely rules in this show? And there must, I am sure there must be entire tumblers about how incredible she is, is Siobhan McSweeney as Sister George Michael, the head nun yeah. at the school. Yeah. Just this unbelievably funny, how do you describe Sister George Michael? She's really sarcastic and deadpan. She seems incredibly bored with her job, <laughs> yet she's also strangely pious and very attached to the religious statues around the school. And suddenly we'll have these little bursts of kind of, you know, uh, this, this very famous imbued discourse you just cannot make out who this person is but she's never not hilarious yeah I totally agree and and the show julia it's like littered with such performances the widow or grandfather of the protagonist is an amazing performance who's just constantly ripping on his son-in-law in the most brutalist way but he's got this slyness and twinkle to him that that comes out so judiciously and uh the sister the aunt is this just wonderful space cadet and it just I, to me this show just every single part of it it just fits into the clock and it just ticks beautifully along i love it i mean there there are so many great performances uh, that's sort of what brings me back around to the main ensemble who it works it definitely works i love the show i'm not saying it doesn't but there's just this like heightened franticness to yeah. Yeah. almost every performance especially in that core five, they're constantly shrieking at one another. <laughs> and they're, and they're um, I really think like two of them are excellent actors and the others. Oh. Um, I think part of what makes that work, even though it does take you a minute to sink into the tone, is just the, it has an unusual aspect for a coming of age show on the heightened emotions of adolescence. Like, t more typically, I think, mm. there's almost like a romantic, nostalgic approach in a coming-of-age show to how the fact that you're having these feelings for the first time and your future is at stake and what is love and what is friendship, like, the, you know, the stakes just all feel so heightened because you've never done any of it before and you don't know what will happen again in the future. Um, and I think more typically, the viewpoint of the show is sympathetic to that. And there's something about the way that this comes together, where even though Lisa McGee clearly has deep affection and sympathy and empathy for the experience of these teenagers, she also kind of gets that they're ridiculous, you yeah. know, like she's, she's sort of skewering them or enticing them to do these self skewering over over the top performances that weirdly work. And the, the kind of acknowledgement that adolescence is fundamentally like ridiculous rather than heroic and glorious is part of what makes this feel so special and interesting. And then having that juxtaposed with the political background you've described, Steve, Steve is also part of what 
makes the whole thing feel like it has so much heft. Can I also say the use of 90s music is just incredible? Oh, I would listen fabulous. to an album, a soundtrack album of this show any day of the week, like the Cranberries and I don't know who all is on there, just like every sort of oh, 90s early, girl band yeah. you can imagine. Sort of er- can I, can I also just say, yeah. well, I played Josh Levine's wonderful one-year episode on the Macarena trend to my kids in the car a couple weeks ago, and I'm now being haunted by the ghost of the Macarena. There was a Macarena scene in After Sun last week. There was a Macarena musical drop in season three of Dairy Girls. Like, I think we just might be an all Macarena show now, and then we're going to have to pick our topics accordingly. So be warned. <laughs> oh, my God. The scene not is not the Macarena, but where they're doing the line dance and they're uh, having yeah. a loud argument as they're all doing these ridiculous uh, moves in unison is just so good. It's so good. Uh, you can go on Spotify and just put uh, Dairy Girls in the search engine. You'll get multiple playlists um, derived from the show. All right. All three seasons of Dairy Girls are on Netflix. Um, I love it unreservedly because I have taste and judgment. And uh, so does Cameron, our producer, who's just had this, like, his face is split into the hugest grin for the whole segment. Dana's sprightly glow is that much more (laughs) warm and nourishing and then julia what can one say right it like it made it made the robot vaguely more humanoid so (laughs) not a total failure all right it's on uh, netflix check it out uh and shoot us an email tell us what you think let's move on it's time to reboot your credit card with apple card apple card gives you unlimited cash back every day on every purchase it's real cash you can spend right away No need to wait and wait for rewards. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone to see your credit limit offer with no impact to your credit score. Subject to credit approval, daily cash is available via an Apple Cash Card or as a statement credit. See Apple Card customer agreement for terms and conditions. Apple Cash Card is issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC. Accepting an Apple Card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab believes in breaking down the barriers to investing, making it accessible to all. Ray is a director of user experience. Her passion is making education accessible to all investors. Through digital design and experiences, Ray ensures Schwab's technology works seamlessly for clients so they can make informed decisions about their finances. I didn't know anything about investing. I didn't learn it in school. What is a stock? What is a mutual fund? What are futures? You know, all these different financial instruments. And so every day I come in thinking about the real person who doesn't want to spend their time studying and becoming experts in this, yet they need to have enough knowledge to make sure they're protected and doing the right things. My expertise is always representing what our clients need, how to talk to them in a way that lets us meet them where they are, and always advocating for doing the right thing for them. At Charles Schwab, they're not just financial people. They're people people, too. With free investing education and 24-7 support, Schwab offers the tools to help you pursue your financial goals. That's how Schwab makes investing accessible for all. Learn more about what sets Schwab apart at schwab.com slash why Schwab. Effectively, money is a system of trust. When I exchange a good or service for it, I trust that the value of the piece of paper you've given me is meaningful, socially meaningful, it's relatively stable. And it has those things because we, the polity, trusts that it's legalized tender, it's properly issued, universally accepted. I will exchange it for a tuna sandwich later and it'll work. This requires intermediaries, though banks, issuers of credit, makers of money, the Fed, the U.S. Mint, or does it? After the 08 financial crisis, trust in intermediaries collapsed and low in 2008. Eight, a pseudonymous person, someone calling himself Satoshi Nakamoto, published a paper sort of maybe inventing crypto, paving the way for a money that is in theory at least trust-free, intermediary-free, 
that's non-national and non-governmental kind of libertarian utopian money. Matt Levine is a, a Bloomberg opinion columnist. He covers finance and he, he knows what he's doing. He himself worked for Goldman Sachs uh, and uh, has been a lawyer at um, uh, Wachtell Lipton uh, and a clerk for the U.S. Court of Appeals. Matt Levine, thank you for coming on the show. It is great to have you. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Matt, you've written a 40,000-word opus explaining very patiently what crypto is. I mean, and I want to emphasize this to our listeners. You should seek this out and read this piece. It's definitive. It's a beautifully explained explainer about what crypto is, how it originated, the use of hashing to encrypt and blockchain to verify it. I may be getting some of those terms wrong. Um, Matt, you did, in fact, explain it as per the title of our episode, like uh, like you were explaining it to a golden retriever. Now, can you double down on the impossible? You've already done the impossible <laughs> once. Can you explain <laughs> your explainer in 30 seconds? Uh, probably not. <laughs> I mean, crypto was invented as a way to send money without without trusting intermediaries, right? People didn't, you know, there was a, a moment in 2008 where people really didn't trust the banks. And there was this idea that we could have a, a system of money that was kind of libertarian and 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 freed from bank and national control. And that ended up being Bitcoin. And from there, a lot of the, the ideas at the core of that kind of spun out into other ideas. So the way that Bitcoin worked, you could program a whole computer to work that way. And so like there were a lot of ways to do what people call programmable money and to build a whole financial system on the blockchain, which is the sort of method that, that Bitcoin uses to send money. And there are kind of like further theories about what you can do with it and building a new form of the internet and a new, you know, almost a new form of society. There's a lot of ways to kind of like reinvent uh, the, the stuff that we do all day on this like new form of database and this new form of this new way of sending money. So that's the basic idea. Uh, and you can take it in a lot of different directions, which I tried to do in the course of 40,000 words. Um, let, let's just extend that explainer a little bit, and then we'll go in some of the really wildly interesting directions that you went in from there. But but it, it, it can't be reproduced costlessly right um in some sense so just explain mining a little bit some sense of how it is that uh, a completely ethereal non-material thing um becomes in a sense scarce and therefore um uh valuable yeah so you're right like that's that's the sort of core problem is that money essentially in 2022 consists of electronic messages right like the like the thing that money is is like i tell my bank to send a message to your bank saying that i've paid you some dollars and your bank updates the database of how many dollars you have and my bank subtracts some dollars from my account and these electronic messages when banks send them there is a a system of trust that allows them to send them in a way that like they're not just like creating dollars willy-nilly right like there is you know, only banks can send those particular messages. Banks are heavily regulated. We trust the banks. There's all this stuff that makes it so that I can't just like give myself $3 billion without (laughs) anyone noticing. Bitcoin, like the idea there is that you're not going to have banks. You're not going to have regulation. You're not going to have a trusted intermediary who sort of says how many dollars there can be. And so you need some other system. And the sort of clever thing at the core of, of, of Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin white paper is that, uh, there is a transaction ledger that is maintained by, in a sense, everyone. Everyone in the system, everyone who sort of uses Bitcoin can contribute to this ledger of how many of like keeping track of who has Bitcoins and who sends them. And there is like, that's cool. That's a way to sort of decentralize and disintermediate and get rid of like, you know, big banks and, and sort of devolve power to the users of the system. But there's a problem with it, which is that, uh, if anyone can do it, then there's a lot of opportunity for mischief, right? If we say that like everyone keeps track of the ledger, then I can come in and say, oh no, actually I have 3 billion Bitcoin, like you're all wrong, right? And then there's like Mm -hmm. controversy. Um, And when you say, well, you have a majority vote or something, but then I can just like start, you know, put like plug a thousand laptops into the Bitcoin network. And then I have a thousand votes to say that I have 3 billion Bitcoin or whatever. So uh, 
the solution that Satoshi finds is basically like you can, everyone can vote or everyone can, can contribute to the consensus, but they need to show a, that they have a stake in it. You, they need to show that they're sort of uh, serious, legitimate actors. And the way you do that, weirdly, is that you waste a lot of energy on it. <laughs> you, you like plug in your laptop and you don't just like say, yes, I, I vote for this transaction. You say, you solve like, trivial but complicated math problems over and over again until you get the right answer and then if you do that then you win and you get to confirm transactions and you also get paid for that in bitcoin um and that's called bitcoin mining and the the the, the point of mining is kind of twofold it can it maintains the ledger of bitcoin transactions it makes it so that people can trust that their bitcoins are you know that that people actually own the bitcoins that they're sending um, and it also like generates bitcoin for the miners so they get paid uh and it is in some ways an extremely clever solution to the problem because it's like there's no there's no you know central party saying you're allowed to you know maintain the ledger there's no regulation there's no need to like trust the miners it's all just incentives make it so that the the miners will do the right thing and confirm transactions on the other hand it's like quite wasteful and uh sort of bad for the environment for bitcoin to use as much electricity as like you know people name different countries at different times but it uses a lot of electricity and so it's a it's a controversial topic but it's a it's an interesting kind of thing at the at the foundation of crypto can i jump in there's the foundational financial problem that bitcoin proposes to solve and there's the true believers who don't want to trust institutions and then there's the as you uh, ably and brilliantly describe in the article kind of set of more usual financial types who are interested in interesting ways to make money who seem to have hopped into the ecosystem. But can I propose there's another foundational problem, which I'm interested in talking about your approach to in this article, which is, it seems like a small percentage of the world is obsessed with crypto, believes it's the future, can't stop thinking about it, can't stop talking about it, can't stop trying to invest in businesses and make money off of it. And then there are the rest of us <laughs> who do not understand it or why everyone is so excited about it and for whom the prospect of making an entire alternate money system when the one we have, though flawed, seems fine. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm interested in the kind of journalistic tactic you've taken here, which is to address an article, I think, to both groups. And I'm curious about sort of how you think about that as a writer and how you think about the the broader media ecosystem surrounding crypto um, because, you know, I've sort of been waiting for you to write this article. And, and my general experience as someone who reads your wonderful newsletter, which is, uh, you know, mostly explaining um, very vividly and clearly the world of finance. In general, when I'm thinking about the world of finance, I feel a little bit like I'm squinting and looking at a magic eye. And then with crypto, it feels like I've squinted and I've got the magic eye resolved. And what it is, is another magic eye that I have to then squint and resolve, like the puzzle upon puzzle of the comprehension problem is pretty substantial for me. Um, and I'm like used to being able to understand things. And yet I find this very difficult to understand. So um, much less so after reading your article. So can, can you talk a little bit about kind of the information economy around crypto and that bifurcation between the insiders and the outsiders and how you thought about that in terms of writing the piece? Yeah. I mean, I like, I feel like that is very true, but also like very true of, of, of the media ecosystem too, where there's a lot written about crypto that is very much from like an insider perspective in the sense of it assumes a high degree of knowledge, it assumes a really high degree of enthusiasm, not even knowledge, like, but just like, <laughs> you know, you know, these coins will go up. What's the best way to make them go up the most, you know? Uh, and so, and, and it's very like sort of jargony and, 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 in and insidery and, and, and unhelpful to normal people. Um, and then there's also, a like mainstream ecosystem that is sort of from the perspective of like, you know, this is all scams, but like, let's hand wave at the blockchain, right? I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to know at what level to start talking about these things, right? It's hard to write about some development in crypto without assuming people like know what a blockchain is and know what Bitcoin is and know what Ethereum is and know who Vitalik Buterin is and all these things, right? And so um, like one like really appealing thing of doing this for, for business week was just, you can start at the beginning and kind of get to an interesting place, right? Like you can spend the time to say, okay, like 
This section is about what a blockchain is. Once you understand that, you can talk about all these other things that are interesting in crypto. Um, and I do also, I mean, I just think that uh, I am in, a, in an interesting position where I find crypto interesting. I spend time reading about it and talking to people about it and thinking about it, but I'm not like a, a like deeply committed true believer. And I felt like I had the ability to write for both groups because I'm not really, you know, either a sort of totally dismissive skeptic or, or a true believer. And I can try, try to bridge that gap to some extent. Uh, and just, there aren't that many people doing that. I think, I mean, there's some, but it's, but it's a, it's a relatively small space because as, as you say, it's like very polarizing and people either are really into it or really opposed to it or, or just really not interested in it. Matt, as a basically enumerate person whose whose eyes turn into pinwheels when anything like a math problem appears in a text, I have to congratulate you for coming the closest anyone ever has to explaining terms like Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrency, all these things that you really painstakingly build up and understanding up from the ground up in this piece. Um, it, it, it's really effective. Uh, I have a question about something you don't write about, which you continually allude to throughout this this text, uh, which is the colorful characters, as you call them, that um, that Bitcoin has become known for. I mean, that essentially people that are interested in crypto and this kind of investment, you know, as, as Steve said earlier, tend to not trust the financial system, tend to be people who consider themselves in some way kind of marginal to the traditional way of thinking about finance and often <laughs> marginal in other ways as well. And you briefly allude as you go through almost in a joking way, like here's another colorful character that we're not going to discuss because we're focusing here on understanding the actual concepts. Um, without having to get into those individual biographies, I just wanted to hear you on whether you think the conversation about cryptocurrency in part continues to sound cryptographic to everyone who's outside that world because the coverage tends to focus on these crazy characters. And we, you know, so that we start to think of it as something that is more about, um, you know, these these maverick investor outsiders than uh, than about anything that could actually apply to our financial lives. Yeah, I mean, my experience is that's often true of other things too, right? I mean, like in, in, in finance, and in tech coverage, there's a lot of focus on colorful personalities because, like, that has just sort of an obvious human interest. Um, I think that it is probably easier to write a story about, you know, how did the financial crisis affect your mortgage than it is to write a story about how did Bitcoin affect your mortgage because one did affect your mortgage and one didn't, right? So, like, there's a sort of obvious uh, uh, hook to to writing structural stories about tech or finance because people use those things every day or interact with them in an obvious way. Whereas if you don't want to interact with crypto, you really don't ever have to interact with crypto. Matt, I came away from the piece with with three takeaways, and I want to kind of read them back to you so you can tell me if I've uh, properly apprehended the 40,000 words here. So takeaway one, the fact that crypto all crashed doesn't mean those of us who don't understand it can just stop squinting at the magic eye and forget about it because it doesn't matter anymore. It's here and the seeds are set and it's it's going to continue being important. So it's worthwhile to try to figure it out. Takeaway two was uh, what I took to be your the thing that you find most interesting about crypto. You write, this is a key financial innovation of crypto. Crypto built an efficient system to make the customers of a business also its shareholders. Um, and the notion of kind of a, 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 of using the decentralization to empower the users of a product to benefit from it and profit from it rather than um, a very small group of rich people. I, I, I could see why that would be exciting and um, why you singled that out. The final takeaway that you describe at the end that landed with me is the notion that there is this massive, 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 like value obliterating crash, you know, mere months ago. And because one of the main problems with crypto and one of the things that seeds the information economy around it is that half the world understand, well, maybe not half, some chunk of the world <laughs> understands and is passionate about it and deeply invested in it. And the rest of us can go happily along like a accumulating points on our target cards and paying for things in cash like chumps um, means that that crash only affected the people who were already invested and it didn't kind of ruin the rest of our lives in the way that the 2008 crash did. Um, but you kind of intimate that that maybe that, that, that kind of thin, slim, slender 
connection between the crypto world and the real world isn't actually going to get firmer. It's just going to mean that crypto gets more valuable once we all live in the metaverse. And you (laughs) say you're not going to explain the metaverse, but that it's like a virtual currency for virtual lives that we're supposedly headed towards if we believe in Mark Zuckerberg. So that's, I I guess my question to you is, did I get that right? (laughs) Yeah, I think that's fair. So a couple of points. One, on, on the first point about, you know, we still need to pay attention to it. Like, I still need to pay attention to it because I read about finance. It's possible that, uh, like one, I think possible outcome for crypto is that a lot of the claims that people make about it being important in real life are false. Some of them are going to be true. And like people do, you know, use Bitcoin to like send remittances to sort of difficult to bank, you know, countries. Um, But like a lot of them are going to be false and a lot of them were sort of just hype. And what, people are definitely building is financial infrastructure. And like one possibility is that in 10 years, uh, a lot of stocks will be traded on sort of crypto rails, crypto exchanges will sort of take over some amount of, of financial infrastructure. And you won't think about that much more than you think about, you know, the computers at the stock exchange today. Uh, and that a lot of what is happening here is sort of hype and exposure for what is essentially a technological infrastructure that might matter to people, might make the financial industry more efficient, might make it easier to do certain kinds of like uh, financial transactions, but that won't like, you know, dominate your life that you won't think about that much. Um, I think that's one real possibility. And that sort of gets to the other question. I mean, yes, like something like $2 trillion of value is erased from crypto and somebody therefore is, you know, some people are therefore poorer by $2 trillion, but you almost don't notice it. And I think a lot of the reason for that is that, uh, this was all, you know, a lot of this was people who had made a lot of funny money really quickly and were like, Oh, wow, I'm a hundred millionaire on paper. And then the next day they were a 30 millionaire and they're like, well, that's still great. You know, who cares? Um, it's not, it's not, you know, people, putting their life savings into this because a lot of the stuff was, was sort of very obviously very speculative. And so you weren't putting your life savings into making big levered bets on Bitcoin going up. Now, some people were, and like there were, you know, and, and often there's like a sort of like fraud or mismarketing element to that. But for the most part, this was kind of all speculative. And when it went down, it was fine. Um, uh, and then, you know, the question is, will it be more integrated into real life such that like the next time there's a big crypto crash, it'll matter to, to people who are not crypto enthusiasts? And the answer is maybe, right? Like, I do think that like crypto, it is, it is, it is somewhat hard for crypto to interface with the real world. It is easier for it to interface with the internet. And, you know, the more that, that, you know, internet becomes the default method of payment for things. And the more that we spend time, you know, on Zoom and video games rather than in real life, the more opportunities there are for crypto to actually matter. Um, but then also, you know, the point I made about building a financial system, if crypto people do a good job of building like the rails for a financial system, then, uh, a crypto crash will just matter more. Like if you're getting your mortgage, you know, indirectly from a crypto thing, then like you'll want crypto prices to stay high. Just like if you're getting your mortgage from a bank in 2008, you wanted banks to do well, even though you didn't like really care personally about banks, but like it turned out that when banks uh, did poorly, that affected you. Mm. All right. Well, unfortunately we have to go. We've gone over. I could talk about this eternally, but I have to point out one wonderful irony if I've got it right from what you just said. The guy looking at his crypto pile and saying that ah, was 100 million now it's 30 million 30 million what in order to give it any kind of as it were currency it is going to be translated for the time being into US dollars right it just doesn't yet have that social sa- it hasn't achieved that social saturation point where it's a thing in itself quite yet um anyway matt a huge pleasure having you on the show and uh the piece is just a triumph and you know really everyone should seek it out so you know huge congratulations on that thank you so much this episode is brought to you by best buy this year let best buy be your holiday hype partner whether you're searching for exciting gifts trying to snag the hottest holiday deals 
or looking for ways to simplify the giving and receiving experience, Best Buy is here to help. Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them, with free next-day delivery on thousands of items, as well as same-day delivery and in-store pickup options. Make Best Buy your go-to gifting destination this holiday season for products that help you enjoy what really matters, like my family's tradition of settling down after all the gifts are opened and all the dinners are eaten to watch a really great movie together. Usually a movie of my choice because by the week between Christmas and New Year's, I've pretty much seen all the year's movies and have some favorites and things that I want to show to my family. So I have some really nice Christmas memories of settling down with our holiday dessert in our lap and forcing my family, lovingly forcing them to watch the movies that were my favorite movies of that year. No matter what your plans may be this holiday season, Best Buy is the perfect destination for all your holiday needs. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy. All right, now is the moment in the podcast we talk about a sponsor. Dana, what uh, what do you got? Hey, listeners, you know that here on the Culture Gab Fest, we're all about getting real when it comes to what's going on in our culture from highbrow to pop. We wanted to share with you another podcast that gets real about one of the biggest issues in American society, our racial divide. Harvard professor Khalil Gibran Muhammad and journalist Ben Austin are best friends. One is black and one is white. They grew up together in Chicago. And on their podcast, Some of My Best Friends Are, they have insightful discussions about the intricacies of race and how it plays a role in everything from politics to pop culture. They have on guests like the former Attorney General Eric Holder or the TikTok historian Sherman Dilla Thomas to join critical conversations that are at once personal, political, and playful. From examining famous interracial friendships to protecting voting rights, Khalil, Ben, and their guests try to make sense of the moment we're all living in. Listen to Some of My Best Friends Are wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Well, now is the moment in our podcast when we endorse Dana. What uh, what do you have? Hey, Steve, can I just jump in before we endorse to say one thing? Of course. So uh, last week we put out a call to you, dear listeners, to hop onto uh, the Apple Podcasts app or your podcast listening app of choice and to rate and review us. And the reason we did that is because podcasting is an ecosystem that favors the new, which is exciting for podcast discovery. Um, All of the various algorithms and apps tend to surface exciting new things you might want to learn about. And we all benefit from that because that's how we discover new stuff. But it means that it can be harder for people to discover old favorites like us, the grizzled veterans of the podcast verse, nearly 15 years into our yakking history. Mm -hmm. Um, So last week, we asked some of you to rate and review us, which can help people discover us. And lo and behold, 15 of you chimed in with wonderful ratings and reviews on just the podcast app alone. Um, So I'm seconding the charge. Please, please do this. Uh, It really, really will help us if you value the show um, and enjoy what you hear here. Just taking a minute to do that can help other people discover the show. Thank you. Yeah, here, here. I think that's a great idea. It really does help us out. All right, uh, Dana, what you got? Steve, I want to endorse uh, something that I saw, a movie that I saw a couple weeks ago that is one of the best movies I've seen this year, and I absolutely love it, but I was a little hesitant to endorse it at first because I'm not sure how many of our listeners will be able to watch it. I guess that depends on where you're listening from and what the distribution plan ends up being for this movie, but it is one of the best documentaries of the year for sure, so just to keep your eye out for it, it is playing, I know right now, in New York at Film Forum, probably showing in LA as well, and will be opening throughout the fall in other places, but keep your eyes open for this Hindi language documentary called All That Breathes. Have either of you seen any trailers or heard anything about All That Breathes? No. So all- Isn't this the bird a bird documentary? Yes, Julia, it's so up your alley mm, because it is about I am excited for that. it is about bird rescuers. It's a documentary about two brothers and their friend in Delhi who have opened or are trying to open a kind of freelance bird rescue out of their apartment. And I don't want to give too much away about what happens over the course of the movie, but essentially they find injured kites, birds of prey that are hovering constantly over Delhi, in part because of the huge piles of garbage and refuse that are everywhere. So it's also a movie in some ways about climate change and and the pollution of that city. Um, But these two brothers just love birds of prey. They're not vets or professionals in any way, but um, but they want to learn more about that world. And they just bring birds home and kind of create this shelter for them before releasing them back into the environment. But as the title All That Breathes suggests, it's really a documentary in a way about animal life and human life coexisting. And uh, it's very contemplative, pretty slow moving, but in a great way. 
So for now, this movie is only in theaters, and I don't think that it's even in broad release yet, but it is an HBO production. So keep your eye on HBO. I suspect that it will go on streaming on HBO sometime in 2023. It's called All That Breathes, and it's directed by Sean Sen, and it's just a beautiful movie. Oh, that sounds amazing. Julia, what do you have? Well, um, in a slight tonal shift, I'd like to recommend an Instagram account, and that Instagram account is by the name of Hot Dads of Picture Books. <laughs> Uh, and it is what it says. It's basically somebody curating pictures of uh, smoke show dads from from picture books. And it's kind of a new account. It doesn't actually have it. It's got about ten thousand followers. I can't I can't attest to its future longevity or or um, really anything. But I appreciate its commitment to the bit. It puts some dads in the grid and others in stories. Don't know why. <laughs> and I think. <laughs> The reason why I enjoy it is not so much because uh, of a particular aesthetic appreciation for the hot dads, but because now that I am back in the picture book trenches reading picture books to my daughter, I have uh, this kind of remembrance of how I felt when I was still in that phase with my older sons who are now nine, which is if you have any kind of like literary critical mind and you spend hours per week reading picture books, some of which are brilliant and some of which are absolute Mm -hmm. dreck, you're just like, where is the critical discourse about picture books? Like I must engage with other minds about these texts. And then it's like nowhere. It's like dance, you know, it's like there's no, there's no criticism of it anymore. And you don't, if you want someone to help shape your thinking on it. So (laughs) try living with somebody who makes picture books. You'll hear about them nonstop day and night. (laughs) The highest theoretical (laughs) elaboration. Maybe, maybe (laughs) your partner should follow this account. And maybe he and I should just hop on the phone at some point. Because I can't say that hot dads of picture books is criticism at all it's just attention it's just attention paid (laughs) to this form that is massively influential that is now back in my brain grapes for you know a couple more years and i'm savoring it and dreading (laughs) it and loving it and reading um the anarchic mischief of good dog carl like 16 times in a row again and man that's a brilliant book actually um no, no dads in that book hot or otherwise but um anyway just I see you people out there who are paying attention to picture books and Hot Dads of Picture Books is a pretty amusing little account. All right. Well, to shift the tone once again, uh, I, the really wonderful Mimi Parker, who is the drummer vocalist uh, of um, the band indie band Low, has died um, this past Saturday. She uh, and her life partner, uh, her husband, Alan Sparhar, formed this band almost 30 years ago. Um, and you know, they're just this very distinctive sound, like, like incredibly low, slow, quiet rock and roll that has this, you know, incantatory, um, quality to it. And it, it tends to, it withholds a lot, but also builds, it's not energyless. It's, I love, I really, truly, I love their music. And, um, so I'm endorsing both Low, who I think people should seek out, um, but also very much the remembrance written by uh, Sam Adams, Slate's own Sam Adams, and a very good friend of this program. The, the indie rock drummer, it's up on Slate now, the indie rock drummer who taught me that making art matters no matter what. And, and you know, the thing is they just didn't sell records, right? They had a certain fan base that was very loyal to them, showed up for them. But they were just interested in doing what they did. They lived in Duluth, Minnesota. They both raised Mormons, might have been practicing Mormons. And they made this crazy, wonderful, spooky rock and roll music. Check them out and check out the Sam Adams piece on Slate, remembering her and the band. It's a wonderful piece of writing. Julia, thank you so much. That was a good, good show. Really fun. Thank you, Steve. Dana, as always, a real pleasure. Such a pleasure. You will find links to some of the things we talked about today at our show page. That's slate.com slash culturefest. And you can email us 
at culturefest at slate.com. Our introductory music is by uh, Nicholas Bertel, the composer, and our production assistant is Jessica Balderrama. Our producer is Cameron Drews for Dana Stevens and Julia Turner. I'm Stephen Metcalf. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you soon. This episode is brought to you by Best Buy. Whether you are searching for exciting gifts or trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, Best Buy is here to help. From air fryers for the aspiring foodies in your life to smartwatches your fitness friends will love, Best Buy is your gifting destination for everyone on your list. Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them with free next day delivery on thousands of items, as well as same day delivery and in-store pickup options. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy.